Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's three o'clock where I am, but around the West Coast, it's probably 12. Not probably, it is, right? If you're in Central Time, it's a little different. So my name is Taylor Edelman. My pronouns are he and him. I'm the LGBTQIA Health and Harm Reduction Manager here at the National Harm Reduction Coalition. Um, and we're really excited to bring you our next iteration of office hours. Because you remember last time we were discussing opioid settlement money, right? And then we also were discussing xylazine, and that was a big two-parter. So if you're interested in getting that content, just reach out to us and we'll be able to provide you the links because all of our office hours are recorded. So including this one, it'll be uploaded at a later time and we'll be able to send it out to everybody that registered. Um, so without further ado, today we're talking about um, using harm reduction to discuss the response to MPV. I know on the West Coast now, right, Deb, they're, they're calling it MPX, um, which we always kind of joke about in a way of like, we're using these acronyms to really say the thing that it means anyway. So I know people are trying very hard not to say monkeypox, so we're saying MPV, we're saying MPX, um, and the language is ever evolving, ever changing, right? So the reason or the impetus for this office hours today is we're really trying, it's broad, right? But we're trying to provide an overview of the response to MPV in relation to unhoused folks, sex workers, and people who use drugs. So, and it's also a way for us too to remain engaged on the topic since there are a lot of communities that are still greatly affected. So we're, we'll talk a little bit about data. We'll talk about the, you know, just overall response because a lot has changed in the last couple of weeks, last month, last three months. Um, so without further ado, you can advance the slide for me, Harmony. Um, I'm just going to introduce our lovely panelists today since we're joined by like an all-star cast. And I'm sure you're more familiar with them uh, than you're familiar with me to be honest, they're amazing. So Cecilia Gentili is an advocate, organizer, and storyteller working at the intersections of sex work, immigrant rights, incarceration issues, and trans liberation. Originally from Argentina, Cecilia came to the United States and survived for 10 years as an undocumented immigrant, gaining a living through sex work. She has years of experience working in direct services with organizations like the LGBT Center and Apicha Community Health Center, which led her moving into policy work, becoming the director of policy at GMHC before creating trans equity consulting to advocate directly for better policy for trans people at the local, state, and federal level. Cecilia is also a founding member of Decrim New York, a coalition working towards the decriminalization, decarceration, and destigmatization of people in the sex trade. Cecilia has also performed in the hit FX show Pose. So if you're like, hmm, she looks familiar. She was on your TVs, folks. In her one-woman show, The Knife Cuts Both Ways, and in countless storytelling events across the country. So, so glad to have Cecilia here, because I keep telling her we keep running into each other, but we've like never really formally met. So thank you for being here, Cecilia. Um, so next up is Kenyon Farrow. So Kenyon is a writer, editor, and strategist whose work has long focused on public health and infectious disease with a focus on racial gender and economic justice. Kenyon recently joined the staff of Prep for All as the Managing Director of Advocacy and Organizing. Previously, Kenyon served as Co-Executive Director of Partners for Dignity and Rights and as Senior Editor of TheBody.com and TheBodyPro.com and U.S. and Global Health Policy Director with Treatment Action Group, TAG. In addition to his political work, Kenyon is a prolific essayist and author. He's the co-editor of the book Letters from Young Activists, Today's Rebels Speak Out. His work has also appeared in many anthologies, including Crisis in Care, Queer Activist Responses to a Global Pandemic, Abolition for the People, Spirited, Affirming the Soul of Black, Lesbian, and Gay Identity for Colored Boys Who Have Considered Suicide When the Rainbow is Still Not Enough, We Have Not Been Moved, Resisting Racism, Militarism in 21st Century America, and Black Gay Genius, Answering Joseph Beam's Call. His work has also appeared in publications such as Medium, The Atlantic, Out, BET.com, The Grio, Color Lines, Logo, Rewire News, City Limits, HuffPost, The Columbus Dispatch, Ohio Capital Journal, and The American Prospect. So yeah, he's done a lot. Kenyon has been hailed for his work by numerous institutions, including Out Magazine's Out 100, The Advocate Magazine's 40 Under 40, Paz Magazine's The Paz 100, The Roots 20 Black LGBT Movers and Shakers, and Black Entertainment Television, which designated him a modern Black history hero. Yeah, so that's Kenyon Farrow, folks. Uh, next up, 
is Deb Boren. So Deb is an addiction and family medicine doctor who has worked in homeless addiction and HIV services for the last 30 years as a social worker, researcher, educator, administrator, medical director, and physician. Her direct clinical work is with people who live on the street and access syringe exchanges, specifically women, people living with HIV, and transitional age youth. Deb oversees health policy for people experiencing homelessness in the city and county of San Francisco. Since COVID-19, she has served various roles, including COVID Command Center Operations Deputy for Prevention, Deputy of Equity and Community Health, and MPX Policy for PEH and People Who Use Drugs. Thanks for being here, Deb. And last but certainly not least, Charles Sanchez. So I'm going to read this in Charles' own words, right? Uh, Charles is very busy being good at a lot of things, especially being gay. A writer openly living with HIV, he is a contributing editor for thebody.com, and his work has been featured in leading publications like Paz Magazine, HuffPost Queer Voices, PositivelyAware.com, Them.us, and more. Charles' groundbreaking web series Marseille, a musical comedy about a person who is living with HIV and isn't sick, sad, or dying, garnered him awards at the official Latino Short Film Festival and America's Rainbow Film Festival, among others. His lifelong dedication to the arts and activism has been recognized on Healthline.com's list of HIV honors, the most influential voices in Paz Magazine's Paz 100. When he's not busy writing, performing, baking, or generally making the world a better place, Charles can be seen charming audiences and his guests on At Home With, his popular Instagram live talk show for the body featuring prominent members of the HIV and LGBTQ plus community. So, wow, I can't believe I made it through that without a sip of water. So, <laughs> um, again, thank you to all our panelists for being here today. And it's quite clear we have a really, really wide array of people with amazing expertise all over the country. We're just talking about it before we went live. We're like, so you're here on the West Coast. Okay, you're, okay, you're in Ohio, you're in Philly physically, but you live in New York. Okay, you're in New York too. So I think where we want to start the discussion today is uh, everybody's favorite, right? We're going to talk about data. So Deb, I know this is this is probably more on the clinical side. This is more for you, but I would like for you to tell us, you know, on a national level, can you talk about where we currently are with the data? And I know you're in California, so kind of what's going on there as well? First of all, thank you so much. I'm so honored to even just be sitting at the table with all of you that are here. And thanks everyone for taking the time of their day to talk about um, one of the many health issues that the people that we work with serve or are part of that community are being faced with. I, I wanna, before I get into data, I wanna just take one step back on a Google Taylor, if that's okay. And that with all of this, no matter what we're talking about, whether it's data, access to testing, access to vaccine that we're going to talk a lot about, we need to really up level the issues of parity and the issues of equity. And I worked at Rikers Island for five years, Cecilia, so I understand parity and what that does and how that is accessible. And I feel like a lot of what I've been experiencing with MPOX and even with COVID feels a lot like when I worked in New York in the late 80s, trying to get um, attention to people that use drugs and people that are living on the street as some as, as a group that is, is affected by, um, by disease states, not just people with resources. And I think it has to be parity. And part of what I'm going to talk to you about with the data is that in this data, our groups are not being counted. So there's not parity with the data. And then there's not equity, which is how we actually get the resources. So MPOX, how it's diagnosed is you have to have a lesion. You have to go to a provider and get that lesion swabbed. So even talking about the data, these are numbers that don't include the people we serve because they've had to identify the lesion, feel safe enough to go to a location to get tested and get an open lesion swabbed in a timely manner. So I just wanna, I'm gonna tell you the data, but it doesn't include, and it's a huge, huge, huge issue that I think if I have any take home, it's the issue of, of how do you get parity and equity for even getting data. People who live on the street and people who use drugs are not counted by the CDC. It is not a question on any lab form. It's not required. And I work very closely with the CDC. It's just, we ask, we ask 
birthday, we ask other identifiers, but we don't ask, and we even are asking in a lot of um, jurisdictions, um, your, your gender identity, and we're asking about who you have sex with it. But we don't ask, where do you sleep? We have an address. And if someone puts in homeless, and if that person is then found by a disease investigator, usually on the phone, then they're counted. And we certainly don't ask if people use drugs. So we do ask people in disease investigation. So all the time when you're gonna look at some of the nitty gritties that I'm gonna give you, it's because a disease investigator would had a phone to call another person on the phone to get the data. So I just wanna just high Google of what's the reality of what we're looking at when I present this. Does that make sense, Taylor? And I don't know if there's any questions, I'm gonna go and give you the numbers. No, that's so, great. so yeah, looking at it with like, like um, you know, squint your eyes and understand. And if we do anything, we have to get better data. So right now what we know is, so a lot of when we, like with COVID, when we look at global issues, we often look at what's happening in Europe and the EU because they're ahead of us. But but globally, there's been about 65,000 cases of MPOX that have been categorized. And it's in about 106 different locations. There's been 26 deaths and 12 of those deaths have been in, the, in places where MPOX, and then we call it MPOX out here, um, has not been seen uh, typically before it's not endemic. And one of those cases has been in the US. We have not been seeing it with healthcare providers and there is a documented case of someone in LA um, that's been with a health, um, that's a healthcare provider. But, but typically we're assuming it's with the groups that we've, we've been talking about. In Europe, the, the cases, and I'm, I didn't show a slide so everyone's eyes are gonna glaze over. Sorry, uh, when I talk about numbers, but the curve is going down, kind of like the bridge here that I'm looking at. Um, and we're seeing that in Europe and we're seeing that someone in the US, but we're seeing a flattening and we're seeing a flattening of the curve. And again, remember this is requiring someone has a lesion, gets tested, goes to a location to get swapped. Does that make sense? So we're having a flattening curve. We don't know what's really going on. Um, in other communities and rural communities where you can't get to a provider in the community I serve where a skin lesion is not a number one priority, go get tested. Um, and in the US is about 25,000 um, cases right now of MPOX disproportionately we're seeing across the board with people in black bodies and Latinx and African-Americans who are classified. So we're seeing disproportionately uh, represented in that in that population, kind of how we're starting with with a really similar to HIV and other cases. In California, there's about 4,900, um, and in San Francisco, when we look at like per 100,000 people, San Francisco has the highest. We have 91 cases per 100,000 in San Francisco. In the U.S., it's 7.5 per 100,000, and then California in general, it's 12.4. So that means if you took 100,000 people we would have 91. So we have a really high um, um, high number. And you can get some of this on the CDC, but there's, you know, some, you can Google forget some like numbers for truth. But, but at the end of the day, everyone understand that this is not counting our people. So, um, and it's one of the things that we're working on and we're actually gonna be working hopefully with the CDC to look at is there subclinical disease. So, um, those are the two, the, the most important points, Taylor. I hope that answered and helped some of the, get us grounded. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that. And you're getting a lot of love in the chat too. Some, somebody in the chat said, I'm hosting an MPXV clinic tomorrow. And thank you for correcting me. I can't even keep up with what acronyms and language we're using. I'll be mm -hmm. honest. It's it's ever evolving. Ever well, it, it's a good question because the World Health yeah. Organization is supposed to come on board. And I think that's another thing, what our communities call this. Um, and what I've been seeing, um, I think that the name the name does matter. Absolutely, yeah, because we all need to be on the same page with it. Because to your point, too, Deb, and I know when we were having preliminary discussions it, with the data, it's not telling the whole story, and that's kind of what's going on here. You're talking about the lack of parity, and I think that's one thing I want to shift over to to Kenya in a bit. You know, especially you know, being with Prep for All and being like a major advocate and doing a lot of work and being vocal about this. And I know everybody can speak on this, but um, Kenyon, can you just talk a little bit about the initial response to MPXV and how has that changed over the last couple of months? Because even when we started to plan this, we were in a different place than we are now. Yeah, so to speak about the early response is to say there was no response um essentially right we had 
identified cases uh, in New York City in uh, May. And um, <clears throat> essentially nothing happened. And um, if I were showing slides, <laughs> which I'm glad we're not, <laughs> um, you would see the sort of trajectory of cases that actually threw, it wasn't really until mid-June. So you had about like five, six weeks of very low uh, transmission of cases, which had we actually deployed what we already had, which was the uh, you know, vaccine um, in place, had we moved that faster, we would not have gotten to the 25,000 cases, um, you know, that, that were mentioned. Um, but, but nothing happened. And, you know, Prep for All um, was one of the groups that really called the federal um, agencies, uh, you know, into a meeting in, uh, in June. And essentially, we were screaming at them on the phone about, and on Zoom, I should say, about you know, where the hell are the vaccines? Like we were able to sort of trace that the US government had um, a stockpile, which later got reported in the Washington Post, that we had a stockpile of millions of doses of this vaccine that our public money, what some people would call taxpayer money, whatever, paid for the development of um, many years ago, right? Um, but those vaccines, the, we had several million uh, doses in the United States that were allowed to expire a few years ago, and they just threw them out. And we had another stockpile of 16 million doses sitting in Copenhagen, Denmark, that the federal government, knew, knowing watching the case numbers rise, did absolutely nothing to just get those vaccines on planes and flown the eight hours from Copenhagen to New York that it would take to get them in the country. Right, and so, so to say there was an abject failure of the government to take this seriously um, from the very beginning is uh, an understatement. Um, so that was like the sort of first level of failure. When it comes to then testing, right, we were hearing very early on from people who thought that they had monkeypox, but because they didn't have what the, you know, if you Google, monk, if you Google, you know, uh, MPOX, I'm sorry, I'm going to use the, the right parlance. Um, if you Google MPOX, you know, you see more um, kind of fully disseminated lesions across the body. But what we were seeing in these cases were not, um, in, in a lot of cases, not that for a lot of folks. It might, people were having like one lesion. People were being sent home. This is particularly happening to black and brown folks, which has been documented. Folks were being told, oh, you might just have a canker sore in your mouth, or you might just have, uh, uh, it might be syphilis, it might be, you know, herpes or whatever, or, or it might just be an ingrown hair, right? Um, and being turned away and not giving, um, and not tested. And it took us even several weeks to kind of ramp up the testing infrastructure um, to do that, which was another thing that Prep and some other organizations sort of fought for. Um, and then the, the same thing sort of follows with treatment and with TPOX is another, uh, drug that has been in development, has been sitting around, has a full FDA approval, and yet it still is classified as an experimental drug, which the initial process that a provider would have to uh, prescribe that medication, there was a hundred page um, uh, sort of guidelines that they had to, paperwork that they had to fill out per person, right? Um, and so finally, CDC streamlined that um, that paperwork so doctors could prescribe it. But we still saw racial disparities in terms of who got access to those things. The last couple of things I'll say on those things. So, you know, part of what we also saw um, in terms of the response was once we started to roll out vaccines, um, cities like New York where we're first to do it, and we saw it in other places, well, you know, set up the sort of online platforms, which black and brown folks could not access, right? I've talked to so many folks in New York City who were trying to get vaccinated and could not. And, and, and then to see on Twitter, you know, black and brown, you know, uh, primarily gay and bisexual men, queer men say, I live in Harlem and I walk past the vaccination site and where I couldn't get a vaccine online and I see nothing but lines of white gay men in Harlem knowing damn well they don't live in Harlem. And in the Bronx, I heard this too. In Queens, I heard this as well. Um, people lined up around the corner, right? And so that kind of created the situation where we have these racial disparities uh, in terms of, of, of diagnosis. 
Um, I'll just say one more thing that so from the, here in Ohio, um, you know, to talk about kind of what happened here in a different part of the country, we um, had our first case diagnosed in, on June 13th um, of this year. Uh, and the state basically did absolutely nothing. They, they did put out a press release saying we have one case in Ohio, we will sort of monitor and see what happens. So I'm watching the case loads go up from just looking at the CDC website. Uh, and then I'm looking at, started looking at the um, federal government website where you can track where the vaccine doses, what, how many doses states are getting. Well into July, Ohio had 4,000 vaccine uh, doses that they had not disseminated to the counties and cities to distribute. Um, and I wrote two op-eds in our kind of state political newspaper that got that ended up getting republished and I ended up doing television interviews. And I'm not trying to say like it was just me, but like that was the thing that really put a lot of pressure on the state um, Department of Health to actually move the damn vaccines, right? And, and then it was community-based organizations like Equitus Health in Columbus and Central Wellness Outreach in Cleveland, the uh, Cleveland LGBT Center, which I'm also on the board. They did all the work that they were not funded to do to get those vaccines into communities. Um, and so we saw the way in states like Ohio and other states with like very very heavily Republican kind of MAGA uh, uh, state leadership, um, even though we're a Medicaid expansion state, right? So it's like most people have health insurance here, um, but we still saw the ways in which like the politics kind of held up what the state health department was willing to do until they got called on the carpet for it. Wow. Thank you for that overview, Kenyon. Yeah, I like your uh, way of framing it in the beginning the response, there was no response in the beginning, right? It wasn't until a lot of pushing and pulling. Um, and a lot of times when we talk about queer community, we talk about, we literally have to fend for ourselves and care for ourselves and community at the end of the day, that's really what we have to drive a lot of these things along. So the fact that, you know, especially in Ohio, where you have one case, there's a press release and then not much being done about it. And you know that it's going to continue to spread and move on. It's, astonishing right so i think one of the things i want to hone in on because we we keep kind of narrowing in like deb mentioned you know our people to use her words you know our people are not being counted and kenyon talking about the racial disparities too right in harlem in the bronx seeing you know droves of white men because i had heard i don't know if this is true and somebody checked me in the city i had heard that someone i don't know if it was a city official or whatever had put in information about where and how to get the vaccines in like a gay circuit kind of chat and then from there uh, which primarily was a lot of um, cis gay white men. And from there, it kind of disseminated. I don't know if that's true. I heard inklings from people in the community. But again, um, you know, that access is, it's it's not across the board for everybody. So I think, Cecilia, I want to focus on a lot of the work that you've done, particularly with um, sex workers and people who engage in sex work, because New York has an interesting situation where you were actually able to work with a lot of folks to change the eligibility. So can you just talk a little bit about, you know, how activism and advocacy work has really shaped or changed some of that eligibility in New York City? Yeah, first of all, thank you uh, for, for having me here. Uh, this is an amazing group of people. Um, I, I wanted to mention, like, you know, when Kenyon was talking about, like, all these, like, Republican people from uh, from uh, from those uh, areas of the country, I'm like, you know, those were all my clients when I was working in New York City. So they come to the city, you know, to have freak sex and do all the shit that they can do there. So be careful, you know, where you're bringing home, you know? Uh, so <laughs> so um, I just wanted to say, like, you know, I was part of the effort and it was a, a, an immense group of people who really put a lot of pressure on the city of New York, which is um, amazing and also lamentable, right? Uh, it is amazing that we are having the kind of um, uh, power as uh, people who have uh, consistently put in the bottom of the barrel, right? Uh, sex workers, immigrants, people of color, you know, who, you know, historically we have not had the kind of political power uh, now being in empower to go to go out to talk to to elected officials and to say like hey 
I am a massage parlor. Uh, I work in a massage parlor. I deserve a vaccine, and you know, and I am not a cisgender man. What are you gonna do for me, right? So it it is really remarkable how like people of all genders, specifically uh, uh, cisgender women and, and transgender people, uh, were able to really find their voice and feel empowered to ask for what they need. And I'm, I'm very proud of the community. Uh, at the same time, it's really lamentable that we have to still do these things, right? It is really lamentable that, you know, the city of New York that continues to portray itself as, a, you know, a super progressive space didn't have the capacity to understand that sex workers were a community that needed to be specifically um, highlighted when it comes to this, right? Uh, and, and it's lamentable that, you know, the city of New York uh, continues to have an approach to everything that is not comprehensive of people engaging in the sex trade. So um, in a way, yay, uh, we did it. We were able to involve, uh, include sex workers in the response. And at the same time, it's terrible that we had to fight for it, right? That, that all this time happened where like people um, that were not uh, cisgender men didn't have an opportunity to, um, to get a vaccine. Uh, I, I, I also wanted to add that when it comes to response from the government, um, I think that, paraphrasing Madonna, the response of the government is a little bit reductive. It's extremely reductive. Vaccines are not the perfect solution, right? If you're a sex worker, rubbing your body against people may be your job, right? That, that may be what you do for living. That may be how you pay your rent. That may be how you pay for your food, right? If you have monkeypox and the government is telling you that you should not be robbing your body against others, what the fuck are you going to do? How are you going to pay for, for your rent? How are you going to survive, right? So creating a, a, a system that could support people going uh, uh, through uh, the monkey, the uh, the the impulse, um, uh, uh, process of healing uh, should be incredibly uh, important. The same thing happened with COVID, right? Uh, uh, you know, the government was like, if you have COVID, or even if you don't have COVID, don't go out, right? If you're a sex worker, if you work in the street, how are you not going to go out to make money? You know, what is it, what is you know. What, what are you gonna do, right? How are we gonna meet the needs of people in the sex trade when it comes to uh, to a specific diagnosis like uh, like like MPV uh, that require isolation? Um, so I, I I think that we have to um, really all of us go one step further when we come to what solutions look like and the vaccines are part of the solution, but the response should be much more comprehensive, if that makes sense. No, I think that makes a lot of sense. I don't know if anybody has particular comments, you know, feel free to respond to anything Cecilia, Kenyon, or Deb has said. But Cecilia, one thing I saw a lot on Twitter, and I don't know if you can speak to this at all, there were people messaging me and other folks in the community talking about how the eligibility, including sex workers and the eligibility was was like almost counterintuitive. Like people would go, but they were afraid of the surveillance aspect and being labeled a sex worker. So they were like, I'm gonna put myself down as non-binary or uh, is that, was that something that was going on that you saw? Yes, uh, yes, that, that happened. But I also, I'm gonna talk about my personal experience and I'm openly trans, right? I walk, you know, I walk around with a T in my forehead. I am proud to be trans and I, I love being trans and I don't, I am happy to disclose my transness. It's not a problem, right? I, I love doing that when I choose to, right? Uh, I was in a closed room with about 10 uh, cisgender gay men 
and I was asked about my sex assigned at birth, my gender identity. Like the woman was screaming. She was like, what was your sex assigned at birth? And I was like, can you just, you know, go? I was like, hmm, man. She was like, oh, and you identify as a woman now? Yeah. yeah. And like everybody just turned faces. It's really uncomfortable. And, and I'm talking as a person who has no problem disclosing their trans identity, right? So for many people, like the whole process of getting the vaccine was extremely uh, um, complicated, right? Uh, um, it was also like incredible how people unfortunately had to be creative about how they would disclose themselves in the pre in the in the in the surveys that they would do to, for eligibility, right? And you know, I, I don't care. I was with like my sex workers, people that I know, I was like, lie, lie, I don't care. Get your vaccine, I don't care, lie. Lie. Who's gonna tell you that you're not a trans man? Lie. You know, I lie about my about my my zip code because if if I put the zip code of my of where I live, which is in Brooklyn, it was no vaccines for me. So I had to say that I live in Chelsea, and I lie, and I'm okay with that. Uh, you know, people people have to get really creative to get the vaccines. Another thing that um, I think is really important it's like when we talk about mpv vaccines right um in 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 the intersection with sex workers i went to do outreach a couple of weeks ago i found like in jackson heights about 50 trans women immigrants uh um in uh, engaging in the in the sex trade in the streets right these trans women may not have the same kind of ability to get the information that they need, right? So it'll be important for the government to put money into organizations to do outreach, right? But the most important thing is that as I was walking uh, through Roosevelt Avenue, I found an incredible number of cisgender, um, mostly Asian, this gender woman, I don't know, I can assume anybody's gender, right? Uh, uh, working uh, outside massage parlors, right? I'm not saying that they were inside the massage parlor waiting for people to come up. They were down there kind of like trying to help clients make that decision to see them, right? Um, these people don't see themselves as sex workers. Uh, they, they don't mostly speak uh, 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 um, English as their first language um, and nobody is reaching out to them. I mean, I, I know here at Red Canary Sun is doing amazing work, but they're a small organization. They have a very small budget and the government is not putting any money into our reaching into these communities, which always end up translating that if you are wealthy, most likely white cisgender gay men, you get to know how to get it, you get to know where to get it, and you get to know how to navigate the situation. But if you are a person who is not a white cisgender man, you have it much more complicated. And the city of New York, I don't know in other spaces, but the city of New York is not helping at all. Wow, that's a lot. That's a lot that we spend right there. But you speak to so many things, right? Like the fact, and people were typing in the chat. I don't know if you saw Cecilia, even Kenyon was like, I told people to lie. I told people to lie their asses off to get the, like you need to, at the end of the day, we want to make sure people are covered and safe and getting the resources. And the fact that people have to lie, right? Like, I don't, I don't blame them. If somebody has to go through that much trouble and jump through that many hoops, something is clearly not working or not happening. I mean, there are a lot of us that would say that it's working, the system's working the way that it was intended to by excluding certain groups of people, right? So I think that's, we're kind of circling a lot of the same themes here. Deb was talking about, you know, the vaccine parity and we're not seeing enough people represented and Kenyon and you, Cecilia, were talking about the same thing. And I think this is a really good segue because Deb was talking about, you know, having the lesion, and going in and getting it checked out. And Charles, you've been someone that is so vocal about your experience. And I, I read 
your piece that you did. I think it was for the body talking about your experience. Um, so I'm really curious, um, you know, what was your experience like and were there any any big takeaways, you know, in in the mindset of, you know, some people had like topical pain creams or laxatives or high fat diets that they went after, anything like that? Well, first of all, it's, uh, I don't recommend monkeypox, I don't, uh, MPX, I don't recommend it, don't do it. Uh, I am also, I'm not a sex worker, but I do work it sexually. Uh, so there's, you know, like I, that is for sure how I got it. I, I, I got it from attending a sex event. Uh, that was really, really fun. Um, and then two weeks later, it wasn't. Um, so yes, I did start my, I had a couple of lesions on my hand and a couple and a lesion on my forehead. And I went and got tested uh, because also, even though I pretty much figured that that's that it was monkeypox, I knew it was important to be counted. Um, and I wasn't very sick yet when I went, I, like I knew I had the lesions and I was starting to feel some nausea. I'd thrown up a little bit, but I wasn't really sick until later um so my first i just went to a clinic and got tested and then it wasn't until i got uh really really sick i was having extraordinarily painful bowel movements that i had never felt like i was screaming in my bathroom uh so my doctor had said go to the emergency room and he recommended bellevue because they start they were the first ones to get patients for in may and this was in july when i got sick um, and at, in Bellevue, they took me right away. They put me in a glass uh, cell of a exam room. And the doctor, when he finally came in, was in a full on hazmat suit. Um, and there was nothing, even though he could, I could tell him my symptoms and he could see I had lesions, they couldn't treat me for monkeypox until the test result came back. And so they only have, they could, that's the protocol, even though they could diagnose you in every other aspect. He, they weren't, they, so they, I didn't get access to TPOX until like four days later when the results came back. By then I was starting to feel better. Um, but the thing that I really, really needed, what, besides like a lot of things to drink and power aid, I couldn't get enough liquids inside me, was drugs, was painkillers. And, and that's really what helped me the most with regards to the pain I was in and having to go to the bathroom. It was this it was as bad a sickness as I've ever had in my life, including COVID and um, any kind of HIV related illness I've had. Oh my God. Yeah, the pain. Um, I've seen some threads like on Twitter online, people just talking about how excruciating it's been. So yeah, I am so sorry that that was your experience and Oh my God. So, so something I, I do want to say, I, mm -hmm. I, I love that we've been talking so much about the inequities with uh, the vaccines and, and something that I just was at a conference uh, with Latinos in the South. And they talked a lot about how all of a sudden when black and brown people started coming in, they started being asked for more identification, for more uh, proof of insurance, even though the vaccine was free and those kinds of barriers that were being put up. But I also wanna make sure we talk about caring for people when they get sick because being diagnosed with, with MPX or just like with HIV, it's very shame filled, you are isolated, you don't wanna tell anybody, you're in this pain by yourself. And I think it's very important to tell people, hey, if you get sick, your people will be there for you. Um, and we'll, you know, we'll do what we can to help you and make sure you get the care that you need and the medical attention that you need. That's a great point. And thank you so much for bringing that up. My God, you know, and that actually, again, everybody's like brilliant here and like segueing into all these beautiful topics. I think my next kind of question for you all, and I know I've kind of been going one by one, but please feel free to jump in at any time. Can we talk a little bit about how um, MPV has been weaponized against the queer community? you know, what kind of impact that's had, because we know that there's been a lot of discourse, a lot of negative discourse, I should say, around that topic. Um, I don't know who wants to take that first. I, I want to jump right in. Um, I, uh, it, it amazed me how much that it, it echoed the uh, AIDS crisis and how much uh, gay men were demonized of whatever color uh, regarding MPX and how it was being initially 
uh, spread or the way that they said it was initially spread, but also it was within our own community of people saying like, oh, you got monkeypox, so you are a slut, whore, whatever you got what you deserved. Um, although people who are lining up for the vaccine were also exchanging phone numbers and meeting people that way. <laughs> so, but I do want to say that I thought it was really amazing how in some of our communities, we really came together to help each other. A lot of people stopped having sex for the summer or stayed within their own people that they knew. Um, sex parties were canceled, which I thought was extraordinarily responsible in New York City of, of, of our own people. Like that was not from the government. That was not, you know, from the city telling people what to do. That was our own communities going like, this is how we're going to help keep, keep us, us safe. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that. I don't know if Cecilia or Kenyon, you have something to add to that as well. Things that you've heard on the ground or just your own kind of feeling about it. Yeah, I mean, I agree with what Charles said. And I think the, the other piece of it that kind of happened was this debate, which was happening actually among queer folks online in particular, was whether or not uh, you, we should be saying that this is, you know, a virus that is, you know, impacting, you know, gay men or trans men or the LGBT community specifically or not. And I, or even whether it can be definitively classified as sexually transmitted, right? And um, and to me, you know, I, I appreciated what a lot of um, that debate, and, and particularly folks who really pushed back against the idea that this was like a quote unquote gay disease. Again, you know what I mean? Because I, I, it was very weird to see this coming from gay men, some of whom are PhD level uh you know folks who uh kind of and it's like what what the fuck did we learn from hiv this was exactly the problem in the beginning i tell people all the time my you know my aunt uh here in cleveland who died in 1983 um we now know died of aids but guess what nobody tested her for it because at that point people were making the assumption it was a gay disease she didn't have a history of injection drug use, um, you know, or sex work or things that they might have been considered testing a cisgender woman uh, for, she just got sick and was dead in six months. And so like, why are we as gay men kind of perpetuating this same bullshit 40 years later with a new virus to me didn't make any sense. And we have seen cases, certainly not, uh, you know, to the level that we've seen, you know, in, in gay men and trans women or whatever, but we are, we've seen cases in children, we've seen cases in, in some cases in cis women or whatever. And, um, you know, so I, I feel like there was a lot of, of, of that. And I think sometimes there's a balance between like, some of it is, you know, just coming from other folks is like rank homophobia, some of it in transphobia, and some of it is just like, people's need to kind of want the, us to pay attention to something happening to our community, which I think is important, but there's a way to do that that doesn't set us up for saying that, you know, this virus is only impacting this community and only ever will, right? Like that doesn't make any sense to do because viruses is, you know, we, we, we made the error of calling, you know, HIV gay related immune deficiency in 1981, 82, and you would think that we would have learned by this point that there is no gay related viral infection like that doesn't make sense just because of where as you where you recognize a virus emerging does not mean that that's where it will stay. I think it is important also to highlight that is um, a, a whole mechanism in, in this country and in the world that feeds on the idea uh, of um, sex uh, being uh, evil and being um, uh, um, not uh, something that we can enjoy, uh, right? And, and even those folks who um, are anti, you know, sex, uh, sex education, sexual freedom, sexual expression, um, somehow always end up uh, being part of the equation because you can't escape it, right? I like having sex. Uh, my neighbor likes having sex. Unless you are like a sexual person who does not enjoy it. Uh, um, most of the people that I know like having sex, right? The rural, you know, uh, men working in Oklahoma 
likes having sex, right? And they're going to have it one way or another one. And most likely, they're not just like having sex with their partners. They like having sex with other people. They, you know, pe you know I, I think this is important to make a call on how important it is to continue working destigmatizing sex and sexual encounters and sexual pressure and bodies and body parts and people's identities, right? Uh, it is an extreme disconnect, uh, uh, even from the LGB with the T or the queer community when it comes to uh, sexual shame and it comes to uh, how we enjoy our bodies differently. So I think this is a great opportunity to highlight the importance to continue educating everybody around uh, the true um, joy of sex and, uh, and, 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 and being sexual uh, for those who are and enjoy it. Thank you for that. Yeah, I know a lot of times in harm reduction, I've had con conversations with folks around pleasure and pleasure principles and, and what that means. And so often we kind of lose that in the larger narrative and it gets demonized, right? And I had a conversation with someone recently too, and they were like, you know, if all of these like anti-trans bills and all this like anti-LGBTQ legislation wasn't going on, do you think that the, the kind of discourse around uh, MPXV would be as bad? And I mean, it's hard to say, right? Like I'm not a, I can't tell, I can't predict something, a hypothetical, but I personally think it, it would be because if you're comparing this to what happened in the 80s, right, with GRID and it literally being called gay cancer, right, and we're talking about HIV and AIDS, we still have a government that is very much the same government that we had. I mean, some people would say it's controversial, but still we have the same structures, we have the same systems and institutions in place that clearly benefit cis, white, heterosexual people. So in my opinion, it's not the most surprising thing. I think it's disappointing. Um, and I welcome anybody, you know, kind of arguing or pushing back against that. But that's just kind of my perspective on it. I don't know if somebody wants to add to that. Um, if not, we can kind of shift a little bit. But yeah. Um, Deb, I do want to go back to you, though, since you do a lot of work um, with people who use drugs and unhoused folks as well. I'm just really curious since we haven't honed in on that. I know you said that a lot of our people aren't being counted, but what has your experience been like caring for, you know, unhoused folks or and just trying to push prevention and care? Have you been able to do that? Or like, what does that look like for you and your team? Well, I want to just say that I'm on my own personal time right now uh, and not at work. So these are my own personal opinions. Um, and anyone who wants to talk to me afterwards, I have a lot of them. Um, but I think the bottom line, what everyone is, is bringing up right here is that we have to stand for sex workers' health when there's not a disease. We have to stand for drug users' health when there's not a disease. We have to stand for health for people experiencing homelessness who have no access to showers or hygiene when there's not a disease. And this is what we, and, and we have already talked about the issue with men who have sex with men and, and all the beautiful things my colleagues, which is my, my new best friends have been saying. And this has to happen when there's not an emergency because in an emergency, they will go to the biggest, shiniest object. As someone who's worked in policy with healthcare, it's usually like when COVID would go up, you know, there's a lot of COVID, no one was paying attention to people experiencing homelessness, but then, you know, the there's less cases and it was all about, you know, people on the street. So when people think you're a vector of evil, they will pay attention to you. So, so I think that what we need to do is just make it and demand that we are looking at people's health and what is unique to people's health and how do we bring health care to folks? There was someone who made a beautiful statement about not understanding Charles's, you know, hearing from Charles, like, wow, what is it like to be sitting there with a disease? You know, I've been working in HIV for 800 years. Um, you know, it's a disease of shame. And though I'm glad Cecile, you like to, Cecile was saying to us before she uses shame as a power against, you know, New York's doing it, LA is doing it. We'd use this with each other, with our cities and we want our cities to feel shame, but I don't want anyone here to feel shame for anything they've done or chosen with their bodies, no matter what it is. And that has to be incorporated in healthcare. So we're pushing a huge rock. And the number one trauma that I work with, with the humans that I serve, is the trauma they've experienced at a very well-meaning health provider that has 
eagerly come with a smile thinking they're doing and saying the right thing. Now, I have some experience that overlap to the humans that I serve. And I've been trained by the best, which is the people that I serve and the case managers. And I never go forth, Taylor, anywhere I go without having either a peer or another case manager to keep an eye on me. Because at the end of the day, I'm still a maniacal doctor. I was a social worker before I was a doctor and it was deep to go from being a patient to someone who uses drugs to being a social worker, to being a doctor and how my voice suddenly mattered more. Um, but everyone's voice matters. So I'm just going to say that that's what we're looking with. And I want to have another conversation and all of us to come back and start talking about how we can change this. I know I can change this as one of the students that I had that worked with me for years wrote in like American Journal of, um, of Family Practice. It's, it can, it's, it's bread and butter mainstream as you can drug use your health primary care. And these are the conversations that we need to have. And I need to sit down with this and we need to have primary care. So that's what we're doing right now is that we're fighting a huge battle. The humans that I serve do not trust medical providers. I'm honored if they trust me and they do because I make sure someone is, you know, watching over me. And I'm always asking for feedback. So I think what's been really interesting is a couple of things. We're going to talk about vaccines and vaccine access, but when we've gone out to syringe exchange and actually I've done MPOX vaccine, there was less questions than COVID. There was less of that conspiracy theory. This is against me. People were like, yeah, you're nodding your head, Kenyon, right? It's been really interesting. I'm, I'm curious for the other folks and, and people that are listening, if they've seen that, if people are like, yeah, I want this vaccine. Um, so, so that's been really curious. And I, and I am um, a bit discouraged that I have not seen the level of aggression. Uh, I mean, aggressive vaccine, um, what I was saying with equity is that people who use drugs and people that live on the street and um, people that are working, you know, three jobs a day can't come to our nine to five vaccine events. And so the issues of poverty and feeding your family and other things are again, getting in the way of people being able to take care of their health. And I think we need to make those things standards as well. How do we make, um, you know, equitable healthcare? And I'm heartbroken to hear about other um, jurisdictions that were making people sign up with such information for when things are free. So I think I've been shocked. I'm always love being wrong, Taylor. And I was wrong about how uh, much um, people were really like, okay, to have a conversation about MPOX for whatever reason. We are, as I said, going to be hopefully doing this um, CDC to look at what's called subclinical disease. So uh, the vaccine that we have is a, it's a, it's a smallpox vaccine. Uh, but it's different and it looks different with antibodies with an MPOX. And we're hoping to look at what, what is a subclinical meaning that we didn't come out and show like what Kenyon was saying. People had small lesions, right? It's not looking like the pictures. Charles, I'm so sorry for your experience, but not everyone like my HIV patients haven't, you know, thank God haven't had that experience. The other thing that's happening is we've not got funded from the government to be able to put people that use drugs or people that are sleeping on couches or doing survival sex to stay on that couch, to be able to stay somewhere. And that is unacceptable. So the people that I'm working with are really in fear of what's going to happen if they do get this, because it's going to be like, you know, an experience where they're big, they, you know, it's hard enough to try to find a safe place to take, to move, to, to, to poop, trying to do that when you're feeling really bad is, is horrible. And you're sleeping outside or you're sleeping in a squat or you're sleeping on someone's couch. So I think having isolation and quarantine and having respite uh, for people that are in those circumstances as part of our mainstream healthcare needs to be our demand and not just for this, but I've been really, it's been really challenging. So our COVID money, some places like LA and I think New York, I think my man said in New York that they've been able to actually use their COVID hotels for MPOX, but we have not been able to do that in San Francisco. If you're in a shelter in San Francisco right now, um, our people have been able to go from the shelter, but we've had a couple of cases where people while waiting for their test results, you know, you have to wait a week were put in isolation in the shelter and had so much embarrassment, you know, and they were like, I shared my makeup with my friends, what's that gonna mean and, and all that jazz. So, so I think that um, how little we know about the, uh, the pandemic, this monkey pox um, has also been impacting. So like this particular client, she had shared her makeup with her other friends. Uh, she didn't have sex with her other, you know, the people was in a trans shelter and she was just horrified and didn't want to be the one that gave it to other people. Now we haven't seen spread in San Francisco in a shelter and we haven't, and my colleagues that are doing what I do in other jurisdictions that so they haven't seen a lot of spread. So I just want to say before I'm going to hand it over is the other thing is about spread. How is this thing spread? What's really the truth? And I think another thing that's come up here and like Kenyon was talking about, what is really the truth about what's going on and get spread? And why did someone have to put a full on hazmat suit to talk to Charles? Meanwhile, you know, his roommate didn't get it. So, you know, what's really going on and, and what, how are we making people feel? So unfortunately, 
MPOX is classified as an aerosol transmissible disease. So that means for occupational safety and health, which drove that provider having to wear that whole suit, Charles, was occupational safety and health standards. It's considered an airborne transmissible disease, though we don't know for sure. Then most cases that we've seen have been skin to skin contact. And that's from what people report. So we don't know. So it's skin to skin contact. What I don't know is how much am I going to see this with people that are living on the street? Now, my patients, the people I serve, they get body lice and scabies and other sorts of things because they're sharing stuff. They don't have a shower, blah, blah, blah. I don't know if this is going to be seen with them for a while. I thought when this all was starting, we were going to get like towels and prevention and no money from the government. So, so how, again, uh, people are, you know, how, again, how we're serving folks has been, been hard. Now our numbers are going down. So I'm, I'm hopeful. We just had um, the Folsom Street Fair and we're having another big fair. And I don't know, we did a lot of vaccines, but I don't know what that's going to look like for spread. And I don't know who those people are that are going to be getting it. So I, that answered more than your question, but I, um, I think part of the issue is that we're, we need to talk about this stuff when there's not a, a, an emergency and we need to get real on that. And, and I need more people like Mary Howe trained me, you know, she stepped, you know, all of this is like how we teach providers how to care for people, right? You don't have to have lived experience like me, but you just have to be willing to listen and how we're getting peers in there and how we're talking about health and wellness just on a good day. And then we're ready for something coming on. So I think that we, um, we need to do more on that. Um, and then I think that we need to stop having these fancy like I read patient information to learn about MPOX. That's how I learned about it. I read patient information. We need to have much more accessible information with zines and other sorts of things about how people learn. And it was really in in interesting how academic a lot of the info was. I don't know, I'm curious what other people have experienced, like how long it took us to kind of get tangible information. And I think that was the other thing that the people that I work with have said, like, you know, what's the truth and what's going on? Thank you for the space. If I could uh, kind of come in after that, I think, you know, so a lot of the conversation, the I come back to just the ways in which, you know, uh, frankly, racism structured like the response from beginning to end, because um, a lot of the questions that we don't know about monkey pasta, especially what we think is a new clade, right, different from what we see in the Democratic Republic of Congo or in central kind of southern Central Africa, where we've seen um, more historically seen cases. And, you know, so first of all, like the questions about, uh, you know, the kind of efficacy of the vaccine for monkeypox versus smallpox, although it's it's weird to me because there, the in order for that vaccine to be approved, it had to, it was there were tests for monkeypox because there wasn't enough smallpox to test it. So they like, you know, it couldn't have, it couldn't have been approved on, on the basis of like a, a smallpox outbreak because we just don't have those as much anymore, you know? So I think, so there's a kind of, I'm interested in kind of that distinction. I, and I know that that's part of the, the kind of research agenda, but the fact that like we didn't, the U.S. government, though we there were have been outbreaks of monkeypox in the last ten years since this particular vaccine was developed, and they did not deploy those vaccines to other countries, mostly in Western and Southern Africa, where they would have been able to answer some of these questions more definitively. First of all, second of all, there's a, a, a Nigerian doctor who five years ago said, "Hey, world, I am seeing uh, cases of monkeypox that or that." do not look like what we normally have been identifying that, that folks have fewer lesions some of them are uh, uh genital lesions rectal lesions etc um and nobody did anything right the world like the who like nobody responded to to that right so a lot of this shit could have been worked out a long time ago so they had the virus you know, moved, you know, across Western Europe and America at this point, we'd have already had answers to those questions if they gave a damn about Africans who had it, right? So that's like, to me, a big part of the problem. And then the, the other piece of it is, um, even in the, the way the kind of guidelines have been drawn around vaccination, you know, was all a result of the fact that like, we didn't like, plan to get the vaccine. So we we wouldn't have had to ask people all these questions about how many people you've been fucking or 
you know, what, you know, all these things, the things I told people to lie. I'm like, girl, just say you're a cum dump and keep it moving. Like, tell them whatever the fuck you need. Tell them whatever, right? Like, you know, and I, and, I, and I had trans friends of mine who were like, you know, I the, all the guidelines are saying gay men. I'm like, girl, go. I don't, and, and put me on the phone if they deny you because I'm going to let them have it, you know? So like, it was, um, all of that though was the result of the fact that we did not like, prepare and have enough vaccine in the country. So therefore, you know, the health departments and CDC, et cetera, were coming up with these different kind of schemes to kind of narrow who could get it when that didn't make sense, right? Like, but so so it was a it was a kind of scarcity model of response, which which was due to a lack of of preparation and planning. And I and the last thing I'll say, maybe we'll get into this later, I just think that like you know, for me, like a kind of looking forward piece is like, we need to be just generally in a place now of, it's clear from having two different disease outbreaks in the last, you know, three years, right? From COVID to monkeypox, that our public health systems are not prepared to meet the issue, the sort of demands of the 21st century. They're not, they're failing. And until we start to say, we need to actually have a serious conversation about what is the future of public health in this country, and then frankly, globally, right, to, to meet the demands of what's happening, we will continue to stop and start, have to start all over with every new outbreak of something, as opposed to designing a system that is responsive to all of it, right, as much as possible, especially in the case of monkeypox. This is not, this is not a, a virus that we did not, though this clay looks a little different, but this is not a virus we did not know. This is not SARS. As COVID-19, right? We actually <laughs> had 50 years of some experience with this virus. And so it shouldn't have even come to this. But that is that to me is a signal that actually our public health system is, is actually uh, uh, not meeting the mark is the best way to say it. Um, I also wanted to uh, just mention when we talked earlier about the language and the CDC and some of the things that were coming out that were unclear. Um, I, I absolutely agree with that. There were a lot of people that were coming to me, finding me on social media and saying, I don't understand any of this information. And I would say like, well, actually I can tell you from personal experience of this and that. I actually was also really up on how to get, you know, I had several different phone numbers for people to call to get the vaccine. But when we talk about language, we have to remember that things need to be translated into Spanish. And there's so many things uh, with, with regards to healthcare across the country that is not translated into Spanish, and specifically monkeypox, because that's what we're talking about. But uh, there were a lot of people that I met when I was at this conference down south that were saying like, yeah, they, they had no idea, uh, they had no information in Spanish, and they didn't even know how to, how to get it or how, who to ask because the people that were asking didn't speak Spanish or didn't have any care to want to even help them. So I think that's something we need to talk about. We talk about healthcare and, and equity. I think across the board, we need to always have things translated into Spanish and to a Spanish that is understandable to people, not just translating jargon. Hi, yeah, and um, I also wanna add like um, for the languages, I'm, I'm a huge supporter of like people that work in massage parlors and most of them um, speak um, some uh, different um, um, Asian um, uh, languages. So. I think that's super important too. Um, I, I wanted to I wanted to mention that um, you know, because everything that we're talking is like really wah 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 wah, and it is right. But I wanted I wanted to just mention like a radical idea for the government. This is an opportunity. This is the great opportunity for the government to make the changes and to use folks. For example, folks who work in the sex trade to get closer to healthcare, right? Every person that goes to get a monkeypox vaccine should be, you know, complemented with like, if you don't have health insurance, these are free doctors for you, right? You know, we have a you know shame, shameless plug. You know, we have a you know Cecilia's occupational network. I call in law. It's free healthcare. If you're a sex worker uh, or you were a sex worker and nobody is going int to interrogate you about if you are a sex worker or not. So I'm, always, I'm like, you just go and say that you're a sex worker and, and you get free services. If you have health insurance, you don't have to pay for any 
co-payments for your for appointments, for your medicine, if you don't, for your mental health uh, um, uh, appointments. If you don't have health insurance, you don't have to pay for anything either, nothing, zero. So it's many of the places that take care of different communities in New York City. And that could be a great opportunity for, uh, for uh, the government, especially the Department of Health and Mental Health or, or the State Department of Health, to use this as an opportunity to get closer to communities that historically has not been uh, comprehended by the medical care system, uh, but by the healthcare system. Uh, so this is a great opportunity to, to the people that never go to the doctor went to get their vaccine. Right, and we have to use this as a way to get them closer. Right, uh, the same folks that that Deb was talking about. Right, that they may be uh, um, engaging in drug use. Right, and they may not. They may not be the first priority to go to the doctor at this moment. Right, but they went to, if if they went to get a vaccine. This is a great opportunity to use this as an engagement tool for communities that historically has not been close to healthcare. And thank you, Cecilia, for you. I feel like you always uplift the conversation in some way. It is very want, want, want. It's heavy, right? And it sucks because, like, I always say to people too, like, if we weren't doing our jobs or this advocacy work, what would be we be doing, right? Like, it's so it, this work is so closely tied to our identities as queer people, and um, again, a lot of the burden tends to fall on us. And I think you know what Kenyon's talking about, Cecilia, you, Charles, and even Deb, all of us are talking about is this very like reactive nature instead of having like things set up, being proactive and thinking ahead. It's like, oh gee, to Kenyon's point, like COVID happening, you think we would have like gotten our shit together and figured something out? No, because the system was flawed and it was kind of rigged, so to speak, in the beginning. And I think you're right. I think we do need to approach public health differently because in my opinion, a lot of public health is very academic. It's very inaccessible. Um, Deb, I know and you talked about being a social worker. And expensive. And if, expensive. If I have health insurance, every time I go to pick up my medicines, it's like $45 copay, right? And you can say, oh, $45 is nothing, but $45 is a lot of money, right? So, you know, kind of like creating opportunities for people to... To, to, not have, to not have to choose between getting treated or getting medicated or getting mental health and eat, right? Mm -hmm. When you have to make that choice, something is terribly wrong. And guess what? It's not your fault. It's the government's fault. I grew up in, in a country that has universal health care, right? I went to the doctor through my, my 26 years of life in Argentina without paying a dollar, right? I know how important it is to access men, access healthcare services and mental health services for free. And that uh, when we talk about that in this country, it seems that people's mind get fucking blown and nobody can, can really understand it. And it's very easy. Health is a right that everybody should be able to get. Absolutely. And I think it's very telling, right, when you have the CDC coming out and being like, I'm paraphrasing clearly, but we're shit. Like, we did a crap job. Like, we have to reorganize or restructure our entire agency. That's pretty telling. And when people are already distrusting of medical systems, how do you re-engage and reestablish it? Um, yeah, sorry, please interrupt sorry, me. Sorry, Go ahead. sorry for interrupting you. That's, you know, a dead. The rapist that says, oh, I'm so sorry. I, I did commit sexual assault and I'm really sorry. No, no, you did. Okay, what are you going to do about it? Don't come to me with this shit like, oh, we did wrong. Okay, and what's the solution? How, what are you going to do from now on? How are you going to prevent this from happening again? How are you going to make up for people that got fucked up through COVID and, 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 and MPOX and, 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 and HIV, right? What are you going to do about it? So I get, I get it, but I get it, but we get comfortable with people's apologies and apologies are not enough. I put all my apologies into paying my rent and guess what? It doesn't, it, you know, they only take money. My landlord only takes money. So, you know, how, I, how is the government is going to make up for all those errors instead of saying, oh, we're sorry, we could have done better. I think that we get comfortable with that. Sorry, Taylor, I'm not mad at you. Um, and that, in the words of like, mommy dearest, I'm not mad at you, I'm mad at the dirt. No more wire hangers, huh? Yeah. No, I'm so glad. 
bust me the axe. <laughs> no, Kenyon, Kenyon, go ahead. This is great. Yeah, I, I was gonna that. say. No, I, I hear you, Cecilia. I will say that I like that. Um, Dr. Walensky at the CDC is that there is they she is actually coming up with an actual plan to redesign and restructure the CDC. I, my concern is that. Uh, I there has not, to my knowledge, at this point, been any community involvement in that conversation. So that is a place where I think that we need to push because I think I think her instincts are right. After you know, just you know, in those situations, she's been at the CDC for about a year and a half, and like kind of being there probably is like, oh shit, this is this is why this is fucked, right? And now like I need to figure out how to like address it but the question um but, but the question of like what what the actual plan is and being i think some more public transparency about that you know uh is important and it's also not just the cdc i think actually the cdc gets a lot of the fire because they're the most sort of visible in terms of like the public health but there's there from the whole health and human services you know kind of federal all those agencies all have some public health, uh, you know, kind of implications from like the reason why, you know, like the T-pox issues of, of, you know, that I mentioned in the beginning, that's an FDA issue, right? That's not the CDC. And we all, we kind of leave them out of, and, and frankly, if I'm, I think they actually need the most work if you're asking me, you know, whatever. So I think like we have to look, uh, to me, it's about like, what is the, what is the vision of a different public health system? I think obviously the CDC has a particular role and things that they need to do to address, but then I think there's, a, there's, there's blame to be thrown around in HHS writ large and, you know, at, at HRSA, at FDA, at NIH, at all those different, um, you know, agencies that are responsible at SAMHSA, et cetera, like we could go down the list. May I say something, Taylor? I think, and I'd love um, other folks if they can comment on this. What, what to do? What you're saying, Cecile and and Kenyon, and is that we have to do it differently. It's not just saying you must do it, but all of you, how we've been doing healthcare in the harm reduction community, at least in San Francisco, is why San Francisco did so well in COVID. It's it wasn't about me, Deb born that I was oversaw and did street based mobile care before COVID, but I was in, then became in charge of our COVID response because how we did work with my community, our community is how we had to do it across all of San Francisco during COVID. So it's how you give care and how the harm reduction community is given care, which has been human centered. Uh, and, and, you know, I, and how what I learned in GMC and all the other places that how our communities have actually given care is how the healthcare system needs to work. So you all are the teachers, not the responders. And I think that we need to switch, you know, do a quantum flip about how and who's making what the roles are about how we give care. And it has to be like what Charles was saying, my community took it upon themselves to make these health choices. We have to flip and stop waiting for the government to do it. We need to tell them how to do it. And you know, when you all are, when Kenya, when you're in charge of the CDC, because I, uh, or when I vote for you. So, but that's how we have to have it done because we've done it so well and they're using our models to actually um, improve healthcare for the general population. So I think that, you know, that, that needs to be the conversation as opposed to responding. It's actually telling and teaching. Does anyone have a specific response to that? No, I think I think that kind of sums up quite beautifully what we're getting at. And obviously, I'm biased, literally working for a place called National Harm Reduction Coalition. But we know that harm reduction works, right? And harm reduction spans across so many things. And that's why we're talking about this, because this is not mutually exclusive, right? Like, we know that there's so much overlap between these movements. Um, and even though we like to categorize people and put them in nice and little neat boxes life is messy and and our responses are not appropriate for the needs of the community at large but um one thing that i did want to go back to um and we'll in about 10 minutes or so depending on how the conversation goes we'll open it up for questions um charles i want to bring it back to you um you know were there what kind of resources were available to you if any you know when you when you had mpox and what you know, you know, like, what would you have liked to seen differently, I guess? 
Well, you know, it, it was pretty early on uh, that we didn't, we still didn't know very much. Um, I, uh, by the time I was offered treatment, uh, my, my condition was already improving. So I kind of didn't take it. And, and, but it was also, uh, I think Kenyon had said that it was an, it's experimental treatment. Not only was it going to be a lot for the doctor to prescribe it, but they wanted me to also keep a record of how of everything that I was doing because it was an exper it's considered experimental. So they wanted every time I took a dose, I had to, you know I was going to have to do all this other stuff. And I thought I'm exhausted. I'm not doing that. Um, but I I didn't get any real other outreach um, from. Uh, organizations or, or the community or anybody in in New York that wasn't my my own friends saying like hey what do you need and what can I do to help you um, so that and there wasn't a lot of resources and there still isn't for for what to do when you have it uh, and and how to take care of yourself and and what's the point that you might need to go to the hospital um, I met somebody over the weekend who said he was he was hospitalized for three days with, with and he wouldn't have gone had someone else in his life said, you are too sick to stay home. You need, to, you need help. And, and I wonder too, like, was I that sick? Or, or um, you know, and I got through it, how I got through it. But I, I just don't think there's a lot of support for, for people who are, who are actually sick and, for, and, and information about what to do to help nurse yourself or, or get care. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, um, you know, like it's very telling too now where you have like long COVID being talked about how many years did it take and people being like, I feel weird. I feel off. I have brain fog. You know, you have people passing away from heart attacks and just like having all of these disease states. And, you know, I wonder with MPV or MPOX, are we going to see more of these resources? That's why I was interested to kind of compare it to, you know, when you had it and you were going through it and where are we at now? I don't, I don't know. I haven't really heard of specific kind of, I, I don't know, programs or, or things specific to people. I know some folks were like, Hey, can I at least get time off of work? Cause you're, they're like, I don't have time to use for this. And you're telling me I need to isolate and how am I going to put food on the table? And then to Celia's point, if you're doing sex work, you know, if you're doing in-person sex work, what other option do you have? You don't have any, and it's just not realistic. It's not pragmatic um for folks so yeah and Deb I think um going back to something you had said earlier before about when you were engaging with folks and them saying okay well I have more questions about the COVID vaccine and not the MPV vaccine did they ever kind of elaborate I'm just curious what the rationale was um I would love there were some comments in the chat Taylor I don't know if you saw that a lot of other people have um, heard the same thing. Like some one one um, attendee said that they their neighbors who wouldn't didn't get the COVID vaccine got the mpox vaccine, and maybe they thought it was because it was a, a new uh, thing. Um, you know, um, I have a lot of conspiracy theories myself. Um, it's very uncomfortable for me to have to say the word like Pfizer when I was talking about vaccine and other sorts of things. Um, so, um, and as I was saying before about having conversations about vaccine, our whole vaccine ambassador and all the work we did with COVID was, was, was harm reduction. How do you create the conditions to have a conversation about um, your health choices and who needs to have those conversations so you feel safe? Like Charles was saying, my friend, you know, like those are the people that we go to, right? So even when I have a question, so I think, the first and most important thing is that they were able to come and get the vaccine at a syringe site where I was standing there and some people had questions. So I think being able to bring it and have it in a way um, where people feel safe to ask questions to say, I don't want it. Uh, there was a lot less push for MPOX, whereas there's much more like you're a bad person. And I am like, I don't do anything anyone asks me to do, you know? And so I think there's a lot of like when someone's pushing something and there isn't, this is a choice that you're having to protect yourself. I think that had something to do with it. I'm, I'm curious what other people have seen across the country. Um, but I'm, and I think, you know, we're all having COVID and COVID health uh, fatigue as well. I, I know that even in our youth, we've seen a lot of cases with transitional age youth and you know, I, I have a trans child and they're binary and they're fluid and my other uh, child is gay and, you know, and are they gonna, you know, there's a lot of fluidity and gender fluidity 
they don't identify as an MSM or other things. And when I'm sure I work with the Homeless Youth Alliance, we're going to see more with youth because they don't think of the labels that we're actually saying that you need to get vaccinated for. So I think, you know, we also had a very low barrier and some doctors said here, so they, they lied. If you're here to get a vaccine with us on the street, you tell me you do the screening. And thank you for coming. And so I think that was the other big thing. I teach all doctors and people that if someone's standing in front of you, like Cecilia was saying, you know, please say thank you. Because when you say thank you, your nervous system is in a state where you're not judging another human being. That is your right, you know, vagal state where you can say thank you. So I think we had a huge lot of gratitude that someone would even come over. I think at least where we're doing the vaccines in a community base, um, we've been seeing uptake. Um, they had a lot of success just Taylor in general, like uh, with COVID where they've been going to parties. So when there are sex parties or there's like a Folsom street fair and other places they've gone to nightclubs. Um, and again, like how we do our PEP and other work and testing, it just, I think we now know we just have to go out there, you know, and do it. So that's the other thing. I hope that answered your question. Yeah, it did. Thank you. Appreciate that. I don't know if anybody else has thoughts. Can you go ahead? Yeah, two two things. So one, uh, back to your kind of point earlier, Taylor, about kind of federal funding for kind of care and stuff. So just to say there was a um, a push that activists were making of the uh, Congress to find, to create an, some emergency resources and then also resources in the FY23 budget for MPOC's response, which um, some of which was to include, uh, you know, some of the kind of like, um, you know, care for people who have to be unemployed or can't work, you know, through through illness. And yesterday, uh, uh, the Republicans pulled that out of the recon of the bill that they're reconciling for spending. So uh, we're back at square one, just so folks know on that issue. Um, so that's one piece. I think to the piece about sort of vaccine hesitancy, I, I have to say that I it's I have in the context of, of impacts, I have seen far less uh hesitancy uh particularly among in you know just black you know queer and trans folks who i know then in covid i think some of it is just the and i i said this the first call we had in early june to fda hhs cdc whatever i said to them you're not going to see what you saw with covid in the because of just the physical manifestation that has a different impact on people than what COVID seemed to be kind of like nebulous, you couldn't really discern, you know, determine what it was, you know, what, what was going on. People did not want those lesions, right? Like, I mean, that's just like uh, what it was. And so you didn't have the hesitancy issue, you had an access problem, like again, where again, on the lot of the cities that rolled out first, like it was white gay men ran to the front of the line, they had the web, you know, the, the internet access, everything else to kind of, or could make those appointments during the day when they happened, et cetera, when other folks like tend to work, you know, night, second shift, third shift or whatever. So um, we, I, to me, it was the, the, the issue was really about getting uh, the access shifted. And so when, um, you know, CDC started doing things like partnering with like, which I know they did at Folsom, they did at Southern Decadence, they also did at Atlanta Black Pride weekend, I was in Atlanta that weekend, they, they did uh, impacts vaccination for, with 4,000 people, uh, which, you know, would not have happened, right? And that was primarily Black queer folks who were out at various, um, and, and Atlanta Black Pride is probably the biggest in the country. And so you had not just folks in Atlanta, but Black folks who were in Atlanta from all over um, who were able to probably get um, first or second dose vaccines there. So I, so for me, I have, I've seen far less hesitancy around monkeypox uh, vaccinations, I think in large part due to the fact that people, the, the visible lesions uh, and the images of that really, and some of the things that people saw, Charles and folks posting what even some of the symptomatic uh, manifestations were like in terms of like the excruciating pain was like something that people were, made them highly motivated to get vac vaccines in, in some, in most cases that I saw. I, uh, I'm going back to wah, 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 wah. But two friends called me during this week. They got monkeypox. They got too comfortable. They had only the first vaccine and they didn't get the second one. Nobody reminds them. Nobody kind of like smash in their head or in social media that it's time to take your second vaccine. 
uh, that the first vaccine alone does not have full coverage. And they're gagging. They're really gagging because they got monkeypox, they got um, the, the MPV, and, um, and they, they, are, they are really upset with themselves. But, you know, um, I, I, I as you know, Deb was mentioning, you know, we're not to shame people, uh, although I do shame uh, elected officials all the time, um, but that works for me, but no people, right? So it's not their fault. It's, it's the, the, the system tell them and reminding them and in, in making sure that folks uh, uh, could have an opportunity to have their second, their second dose. So, and for many of us, it was extremely frustrating to get the first one, so it makes sense that we may not be paying um, a lot of attention to the second one. But I just wanted to say, we need to start working on getting people fully vaccinated. A lot of people got only one vaccine and that's not enough. Yeah, and how many times like with COVID, oh my God, those freaking text alerts. Does everybody remember that? That like V-safe, that like in my sleep, I get woken up, V-safe, how are you feeling right now? I'm like, not great, you woke me up. But like, why don't we get the same thing, right? Like, I know not everybody has a cell phone. That's another big barrier, right? But at the very least, some kind of reminder system would be nice. I mean, is that too much to ask? I don't know. Maybe it is. Maybe it is. Um, so if anybody else has something to say on that, if not, um, we can hop over to some questions. And Deb is writing furiously and answering all these great questions. And I appreciate that. Uh, somebody did type in a question in the chat earlier, and this goes back to kind of data capture and when Cecilia was telling us that like really crappy story about that person shouting all of her personal information wherever she was in the clinic, it's awful, but uh, this person asked, is there a quote unquote sweet spot between recording data that reflects the impact on specific populations without capturing data that is too invasive of individuals' privacy? And I'll put that back in the chat too, just so everybody can see that. All right, perfect. So everybody can see it there. Yeah, and I know that's a question that gets asked a lot. I don't know if anybody feels comfortable taking it and it's okay if not. Um, and I think, yeah, yeah, go ahead, Kenyon, go ahead. Yeah, I was trying to shut up, but I'll get the first one. Like, I think um, the, yeah, I, I do. I do think there's a difference between, um, like I said, so, well, some of the, the quote unquote data collection was about determining risk profile. And that was only done because we were in such a um, shortage, right? So it, so those questions became about rationing, right? Are you, you know, fucking enough to be very blunt in order to deserve this vaccine? And, and, and so it, it, it and so to me, it just, it was infuriating because both of the levels of ways it is, you know, stigmatizing to folks or whatever, but also it just, it became people's individual problem to disclose whatever kind of sex and how much they were having. When the real problem is that our government failed to get the vaccines in the country so that we would have enough for whomever showed up, right? And so instead of that, we what we got was, you know, this thing. And we, we also know, from um, PrEP that that kind of, the, the way that the clinical guidelines for PrEP were, were written until they were changed a year ago. So the first, you know, decade of, of PrEP um, where people were also asked to kind of demonstrate that they were having enough quote unquote risky sex in order to deserve being on PrEP, cut a lot of people who were still at high risk, right? Because just because they're not having, you know, whatever was determined in those clinical guidelines as like, uh, you know, enough sex to put them at risk. But if they're, you know, frankly, queer or trans, and especially in communities where, um, you know, the HIV uh, rates are already high in, in cases, and particularly in like the southern states where you don't have Medicaid expansion, so you have more people who are um, not virally suppressed, like all that. So I was glad last year when the guidelines got changed to basically just asking people, are you having sex or do you want to be? 
<laughs> and and if let's if, if if the answer is yes to either of those questions, then let's make sure your HIV negative and happy negative and we'll and then you could get on this this prep like that. And so to me, so I, I, I I'm gonna, I'll shut up in a second just to say that like yeah. So to me, like that is that it should be the extent. Like I understand some of the demographic data or whatever. I could understand doing data so people you know who are potentially monkey impox positive who have lesions in places and you want to do you kind of need to have some kind of clinical uh data to look at you know how something is spreading or not that makes some sense but some of these questions had nothing to do they, it was just a weed out strategy to to actually control for a vaccine shortage which was not that person's problem when they showed up it was a government failure problem that got cloaked into a risk profile it got it got kind of disguised as risk profile and are you at risk enough for this vaccine when it was really about a shortage Absolutely. Absolutely. I think you nailed that one, Kenyon. I appreciate that. And um, somebody had put in the in the chat too, the CDC has been known to throw in research questions on their case report forums. As an epidemiologist, we would often fight back and say, we're not asking this. It's research and not relevant. There is a disconnect between the ivory tower, in parentheses, CDC, and local public health. So I think that's speaking a lot to what you're saying. Um, and again, there's a lot of finger pointing down at the community and not enough people pointing up because of power and influence and money and things like that, right? Um, that's great. Thank you. Um, one of the next ones I want to touch on, Deb, I know you you went over this, but maybe you can expand on it a little bit. Um, somebody asked, what kind of resources are helpful in advocating for slash distributing to people who live on the street and people who use drugs to help protect against infection? Um, housing, number one, um, and uh, hygiene, which should be a human right, and a place to go to the bathroom, which again should be a human right. One of the things we do is we actually collect poop from all the people living in San Francisco, and in many of your jurisdictions do that as well, to know what is going on with the disease state. Guess whose poop we don't know? People who live on the street and don't poop, and to uh, the sewer system. So we don't know enough about what's going on and I can't advocate for more isolation quarantine or other sorts of things. So um, so hygiene is important on many levels. So uh, housing, um, hygiene, uh, laundry, clean clothes and vouchers. We don't know, and I had answered this in the chat, really how this is spread. So the CDC reports that uh, MPOX is spread um, skin to skin, prolonged skin to skin contact. Uh, all body fluids, but we don't know like with HIV, like the amount and all the fluids yet. Um, uh, airborne, again, hasn't been cases, but that's why Charles was there with a hazmat suit on, right? We can't six feet and all that jazz. And then we don't know um, about um, about what's going to, about uh, and other, um, and other, if there's other ways, which is called fomite. So fomites are things that live on other surfaces. So there's, there's surfaces like this, this is my paper towel, and there's surfaces, this is my tarot card that I pulled before here. It's a shiny flat surface. I always pull tarot cards. We have a page of cups um, to know what I had to talk about and focus on. So that's a shiny surface. It's a different kind of surfaces, and foam might sit differently on these different kinds of surfaces. Supposedly in the blanket or something like that, um, like with body lice, it's going to sit on there, but we haven't seen any cases. So when we started this off and we should all be pushing for laundry anyhow uh, and showers. Cause you know, when you feel like when you don't feel well and you're like, what do you want to go do? You want to go take a shower. And so and I get very upset when people like get everyone to behavioral health and like behavioral health is a shower. That's what it is. So uh, that's our mental health. But so those things that we need to get every day are the essentials uh, for people that are living on the street. Um, and then the other huge issue is that people have to use their bodies in order to eat, in order to stay where they're staying and to make their money. And we need to, we also talked in San Francisco and didn't come forth. How is the money that we are giving to people, um, uh, you know, if we can get reimbursement and if someone who's doing sex work, how do we, you know, if they have MPOX or they're using their bodies um, to make money, we need to be able to pay them so they have a living and without any judgment. And then we don't, we don't have that. But those are the things, at least in San Francisco, we're like, let's, let's do it. Um, but that I would recommend for jurisdictions to have. Awesome. Thank you for that. Um, anybody have anything else to add on that front? 
No, if not, I'll move on to the next one. So um, Danielle asked, how do we bring people on to the somewhat less stigmatizing messaging when the vaccine eligibility doesn't match the messaging? It's hard. <laughs> It's hard, it's hard, right? I think uh, I think the, the 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 most important thing at this time is to be to again I'm going back to normalizing sex and normalizing sexuality and normalizing sexual encounters, uh, you know, and, and empower people uh, who are who enjoy um, uh, sex and, and at the same time saying, you know, that. Um, uh, uh, that the, the, this is uh, and it's mostly sexual transmitted um, um, uh, diagnosis that, that you may come across, but also at the same time that is preventable. And, uh, and, and, and that information, information and the correct information is very, very important. Yeah, I think that had we, you know, that tell people what you know and tell them also what you don't know. Right. And I think that was something we failed to do with COVID, which was to say, listen, this is a, um, you know, a new emerging dis disease. We're learning as we go. What we say today about guidance might change later. And I think a lot of people would have understood that more than the constantly changing, you know, is it. Is it airborne? Is it is it respiratory droplets, which for the average person is a non-point, right? <laughs> it's like no difference, right? From from a protection standpoint, right? It's a scientific question that should not be a public debate, um, and you know whatever. And so I think in the case of of, of impacts, similar. What we could say is this is like it had. There should have just been the kind of press conferences straight up to say, this is what we know, right? This is what we're seeing. This looks like potentially a new clade and it might be different from the way we've seen, you know, impacts for the last 50 years because this is where we're seeing it or how we're seeing it show up. We don't know if it's sexually transmitted or if it's just mucosal, you know, which has a slightly different, you know, meaning. And, um, and we're seeing it in, you know, uh, you know, queer men, trans folks, et cetera, but that doesn't mean that's where the virus will stop, right? And so we're going to deploy this vaccination strategy with this community first, the same way we did with COVID, where we ranked, you know, people who were over 65 and with comorbidities that we knew were more likely to lead to hospitalization and, and fatalities for COVID. And then we're going to move down the list, right, for people who want vaccines. We should have said that same, that should have been the same message with, with impacts, but we have actually failed to, not. I shouldn't even say we created messaging. We actually haven't really created a, some sense of real clarity of, of messaging about, you know, not only how it's transmitted, et cetera, but then like, this is why we're deploying this particular vaccine strategy. And then once we feel like we have enough doses and then we're able to get it to more people, then we'll expand as we go. That was the same thing we did with COVID, but I don't know why we didn't say that. Cause I think people would have understood that the way people who at least were interested in getting vaccinated for COVID early on understood why we had those, you know, that kind of like stair step model of rolling it out. Cause we were, it was a supply issue, which is the same issue that we're dealing with now. Well, what we were dealing with early on with impacts was a supply issue that we turned into something else. Yeah, I often think, Kenyon, to that point that a lot of officials, I might be speaking out of turn, don't like not knowing the answer or, or having a lack of control. It's, it's all about controlling this narrative and making it appear as though everything's under control when the house is literally burning down behind them. And it's like, it's like two kids in a trench coat, you know what I mean? Like walking around, you're like, oh my gosh, that's not an adult person trying to get into the movie theater. Those are two kids in a jacket. But um. That's my perception is that everybody likes to have all the answers. And I think when you're being genuine with people like us as trainers here at NHRC, we're always like, we don't know that, but we will try to find somebody who does know that. And I think people respond well because the community is done with bullshit. They can read bullshit a mile away. They know what it smells like, what it looks like. Um, yeah, that's that's just my piece on it. I do want to um, uplift something Deb said in the chat that's super important when we talk about people who use drugs is... Um, she said, I also want to add about pipes and bubbles for people who use drugs. We need to make them available, available and no stigma. 
people should not be forced to share needles or bubbles and pipes. Absolutely. And if your harm reduction only includes syringes, please, please, please reach out to us. Uh, you should be giving people uh, safer smoking kits as well with stems, bubbles, um, because we know that those things work. Yeah, go ahead. And Taylor, I, I just, I should have said that before. One of the things that was good about COVID is that we've had a lot of pushback for bubbles and pipes. Like, like I just, as far as we've pushed for, you know, sharing needles, that needles are okay, but pipes are not okay. And we had, we're not allowed, I know, I don't understand. So uh, we were not allowed to give them out in syringe places or that we couldn't get them paid for by the city. Um, and many jurisdictions are like this. And then COVID, we were actually paid being able to use that as a reason to to get them and we don't know um as i said before if um something that's that you can spread it but we think it's with fluids so i it's a really important and a great opportunity to push for getting pipes and bubbles available to people so to, that this is um potentially spread and we need to protect this population and um to protect the community so um i forgot forgot about that but we need to take advantage of a public health emergency to do the right thing in general Absolutely, absolutely. And um, Deb, I know you already took a shot at answering this, but I'll say this just if we have anybody listening on audio, Akil Campbell says or asks, how do we get institutions of higher learning involved in vaccination efforts? Is it not needed? So Deb, I know you spoke on that a little bit. You said UCSF. Um, yeah, yeah so UCSF, it's really, uh, Margaret Cushell, if those of you don't know her, leads the, um, really incredible um, Benioff Institute uh, I can't uh, for people experiencing homelessness and research. And if it wasn't for her and her program, we probably wouldn't have been able to do the amount of vaccine. Um, and she also did huge studies looking at COVID and rates of COVID uh, in, in unsheltered populations. So we have great uh, academic, even in, in harm reduction research here in San Francisco. So academic institutions can do things that public health can't. Uh, the first syringe site I ever worked with, you know, the one in Yale um, there and then Columbia, other places actually, the CDC wanted to support. So we don't want to sell off um, to the man uh, or whoever, but it is a great opportunity uh, to look at how academic institutions can do things that public health can't. So I, I encourage all of you um, to reach out and to befriend your academic um, colleagues because um, they can get they can get shit done. I love that. And thank you, Laura, for linking us in the chat. It's great. And just a reminder too, these um, links, I'm going to save the chat. And when the you know video is all done and nice and pretty and mm -hmm. edited and everything, um, we'll send out these resources as well. But feel free to save the chat. Yeah. Awesome. So any questions? I know we're kind of wrapping here. And man, we are really good on time. This is very impressive. Um, if not, I'll just ask the panelists if you have any kind of closing thoughts. I mean, we've gone from like Earth to Pluto. I know it's not a planet anymore and back and like cross left and right, up and down. We've covered a lot of ground in almost two hours. Are there things um, that maybe make you hopeful about these conversations? Like what do you what would you like to see next? I know, Ken, you've talked a lot about, you know, your conversations and your phone calls and uh, the disappointing news and having, you know, the funding um, for MPOX taken out of, of the budget, right, and things like that. But are there, like, what are the next steps? What are things that you're kind of hopeful about or you're seeing or looking forward to when we're talking about this? I, I mean, you know, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't feel like the hopeful girl. On this <laughs> Just because there's so many, there's so much mess going on that um i think that even you know if we were able to kind of like solve just the kind of monkeypox outbreak in and of itself it's also happening in the context where there's so much uh uh transphobic legislation that is aimed at so much racist legislation so much uh the you know anti-abortion and the you know misogyny of it all i just feel like there's there's like just so much going on there's animating this particular that is also made doing this particular work um around impacts really challenging um you know there's that I, I i guess what i would say is that um i do i am sort of uh 
I'm happy with what I feel like has been um, a real um, coming together of kind of queer communities in a certain way to respond to this and to push where government failures have happened, whether at the federal, you know, state, county, city level, where just so like folks on this call and all the folks I've seen around the country who, you know, were, um, you know, who really just pushed to make shit happen where they were because there wasn't, you know, a state governor or health department that didn't give a damn and didn't do anything and et cetera, right? And so I, to me, the, the place of hope that I have is really in, you know, um, a, a, a community of, of queer and trans folks who really pushed in ways to have each other's back and make a, a system respond to them um, in ways that I, I, I feel like I, I haven't seen in a long time and ways that I've actually just been, um, you know, just I feel like in the in the sort of years post sort of like the same sex marriage wins, I feel like the infrastructure for queer activism and organizing, with the exception of like the I feel like the really important growth of like trans organizing work, the broader sort of other community organizations seem to be floundering for like issues and how to strategize and what to do and whatever. And so to see like organizations and individuals really come together in this moment around MPOX to me is, is where I have hope. That's great. Thank you, Kenyon. Yeah, and um, I know you said you didn't feel hopeful, but you definitely are getting love in the chat. And, you know, I think you're connecting the dots for a lot of people. Yeah. Anybody else have their final closing thought? Well, for, I just want to say I love, love, love that Kenyon, when, when you asked about hope, he went, mm. Mm. and it took him a little bit. Because I think we're all that way. We're all like, oh, well, you're talking about the government. We're talking about uh, failures of the government when it comes to health and, and marginalized, marginalized communities. Um, but I think that Kenyon is absolutely right, that it's it's the community that has given me hope. It's friends who've said, I'm taking three friends with me to get vaccinated. They don't have appointments, but we're not leaving until we all get vaccinated. Um, and things like that, and sharing that information on a grassroots, it's us against them kind of level. And that has given me like, fired me up more than anything else, because the government, it just seems like everything is trickle down theory. Like by the time uh, the, the monkeypox vaccine gets down to me, I've already done been had it. So, uh, you know, they're not they're not here to help me, but my, my friends and my community are here to help me. And I think it is very important to highlight. Thank you, Kenyon and Arthur, and thank you, uh, Charles, for for that. I just in that in that kind of sentiment, I'm going to say like our communities, the communities that we're talking about, have been consistently seen as the problem. And this is another way in which we show up, show that we are the solution, that we are the solution. And, and it is very, very important. We are the solution. And Deb, I see you kind of, you know, hand over heart there. Do you have any closing words for us? I'm, I'm assuming that you agree and you're very touched by what's I wasn't going to say anything, but I am going to check about my tarot card that I pulled. Because <laughs> 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 uh, I believe it like data and it's a page of cups, which is about incredible sweetness like we had when we were kids and believing that world is love and that we can find love. And I just, it echoes what uh, Kenyon and Charles and Cecilia said that the community and their love for each other is much more powerful than any um, in any government or health system and healing. And it's gonna help us do the right thing. I can only say that I agree with that. And what brings me hope as well is that we have conversations like this and we're continuing to engage. And because um, some people, when they see those cases declining, they're like, that's it, you know, wrap it up, we're on to the next thing. Absolutely not. Uh, if anybody knows anything about harm reduction, it's all about engaging people. It's keeping conversations open, having genuine and honest conversations with one another. Um, so if anything, you know, I hope I hope people come away with that. Okay. Um, with that said, I thank all of our beautiful, wonderful panelists for spending two hours hashing this out, talking with us. Um, so big thank you to Cecilia, to Deb Bourne, Charles, and Kenyon. It's all been wonderful. Hopefully, this is the first of many continued conversations that we have because um, this is this is really not going away or going anywhere anytime soon. But um, 
I'm definitely feeling hopeful just meeting you all, you know, sharing this space and talking about it. So just to sum it up in the logistical end, I said this earlier, but for those still with us, this has been recorded. So you will receive this recording at some point, hopefully in the near future, right? So just bear with us, um, as well as the resources and things that have been posted in the chat. So yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>